like Elizabeth Warren, who thinks that the right answer is to break up the companies, um, you know, I mean, if she gets elected president, then I would, I would bet that we will have a legal challenge, and I would bet that we will win the legal challenge. Now, you probably recognize his voice. That's Mark Zuckerberg. But unlike how he usually is, where he has the whole robot meme of talking very guardedly, controlled in what he says, usually it's before Congress when you hear him talk. Right here, he's speaking a lot like a human because he's speaking candidly in a meeting that he doesn't know is being recorded. This is recorded by somebody that works at Facebook. It was leaked or sold to The Verge. And it's two hours of audio of him talking about future plans, about political struggles, and all these different things with Facebook. I want to look into this. I think it's really interesting to see Mark Zuckerberg speak in a way that he normally doesn't talk. So we'll be talking about this. In other news, we have Schwab, one of the biggest brokerages, deciding to cut its trading fees. Along with that, a lot of other brokerages followed. And so there's this whole brokerage war of slashing fees, racing to the bottom. I've had a lot of people ask about this. So I'm going to give you my opinion on this, what I think is going on. And then, of course, a lot of things have happened in the past week with my portfolio and with the market. I'm going to be talking about this crazy week we had in the market, as well as the companies that I've sold, the ones that I've decided to keep and for the different reasons. After that, of course, we have lots of comments and criticisms and fun things to respond to. So I think it'll be a fun episode. I hope you guys stick around. Let's jump in to my portfolio and the performance over the past week, because as some of you know, we had a pretty bumpy week in the market. Over here on Twitter, I tweeted out a screen cap of my account like this Wednesday, and my portfolio had dropped $728 in the past five days. So that's 1.28%. That's a pretty significant amount of money, $700, right? I wasn't really concerned about it. This type of thing doesn't bother me. When companies are struggling and cutting their dividends, that's what bothers me. When the stock market just drops, I think that's just a great time to reinvest those dividends to buy more shares. So this didn't bother me, but regardless, I had a lot of people ask me, you know, wanting to know my reaction to the market dropping and what to do. And I look at it. If I go to the week view here, I'm up $81 at the end of the week. Wasn't such a terrible week after all. If I break this down, $7 is due to market gains. Earned dividends, $74 this week. So had a lot of earned dividends. If I go to the one month here, I'm up $1,000. $805 is market gains. Earned dividends, $211. Like I always focus on, it's this bottom line. I like seeing the income come in every single time because this bottom line, the earned dividends can only be positive. That's income that I'm getting in that's really stable at this point. Now, I sold a handful of companies that I went through the last video. If you haven't seen the last video, that will go through all the companies I'm thinking about selling. And this one, I'll show you what I ended up doing. Let's go ahead and jump into real estate first. Real estate, I shaved off a handful of companies. I kept Realty Income Corp, Well Tower, Simon Property, LTC, Store Capital. I got rid of Annalee Capital. I got rid of Iron Mountain. I got rid of Preferred Apartments. The one I also sold out of, but you guys changed my mind on, was NRZ, New Residential Investment. I don't think there was a single company that I went through on my whole list of like 10 different companies I was looking at selling that I had more people write in and explain and and want me to do additional research on NRZ. I decided that I'm going to keep this holding. Uh, It's your guys' fault if it doesn't perform well, so I'm going to blame you. If it tanks or something, I'll put a GoFundMe so you can bring it back up to where it was. But NRZ was one that I was planning on selling, but I'm going to go ahead and buy back into it. The market opened on Monday. Luckily, the price that I sold it at is almost identical to the price it's sitting at right now. I have an order. I'm going to be holding a position in this starting Monday, but the other three companies in this real estate sector have been sold. I think these are all pretty solid companies, pretty well diversified. I feel really good about this sector. The next one, bonds. I didn't change anything with that, so I'm not going to go into that. Finance. I ended up keeping Wells Fargo. So I'm going to hold on to Wells Fargo. I'm going to keep this finance pie exactly how it is. The next one after this, healthcare. With healthcare, I also decided to keep United Health Group. There is some risk with this one. It's political risk. If our country moves toward a single pay system, it will very much harm this holding. It's private insurance. If we had a single payer system, private insurance would be hurt and this company's all private insurance. So it would definitely get hurt. It wouldn't all of a sudden go completely bankrupt, but it would just have a lot of its profit shaved off. So that's the only risk, but right now we're really far away from that. Without that risk, the fundamentals of this company are superb. 
just at the book value everything fundamentally with this company is extremely good it's very undervalued if you take out that risk of single payer that's kind of the coin flip that i'm playing here is that i don't think that we're that close to implementing a large single payer system that gets rid of private insurance so i'm going to hold on to this company it's otherwise extremely stable moving on to utilities i didn't sell any of these none of them were on the chopping block to begin with consumer i did sell texas roadhouse so that one was is just such a small holding it, you know, the company could have doubled in size and I would have made like a hundred bucks. So I've just tried to shave off a holding. I still might shave off one of these, but I like all the companies right now. So this is still kind of a crowded sector. There's some companies I don't have a lot of money into, but I'm going to hang on to all of them for the meantime. In telecom, I didn't sell AT&T or Verizon. Industrials. I did make some sales here. I sold Caterpillar, I sold UTX, and I sold the UPS. So got rid of three of those companies. Again, this was a really crowded sector. I had a lot of companies for not a whole lot of money. And so getting rid of those companies, I think they were all honestly really solid companies. It's just a matter of picking which ones I really wanna hold because there's not enough money to go around all of these holdings. And 3M, I only have about 400 bucks in it. And that's after selling those other three companies. So what I did was I just consolidated a little bit of this section here. I think it was some good moves, but we'll see how that turns out. The ones that I did sell, I think if you hold them in your portfolio, I think that they're all pretty solid companies in technology i didn't sell any of those and then in energy i actually am planning on making two sales so this is one that i actually wasn't planning on making any changes to but i went through and just read about each of these companies and what i realized that i did is i bought four very similar companies they all kind of do the same thing what i decided to do was just cut out the two of them that i think are positioned weaker and put that money into the ones that i think are stronger all these companies have really high yields so they're all like five percent or above so it's not a matter of which one i think is really best value right now i just think chevron and exxon mobile are better positioned and they're doing the same exact thing that these two companies do. So I just consolidated a little bit. I'm gonna move out of these two companies and put this money into these two companies. And then I'm gonna to have to do further research on this energy sector. But that's it. If I actually go to the passive income pie here, this is the view where I go to my pies, research my pies, and this shows you more of like a statistical view of it. It has 52 holdings, right? Not 61 anymore. So I sold out of all those holdings. The dividend yield fell slightly, 3.7% yield, still really good starting yield. Um, the low expense ratio is just from the bonds right here in this sector. Other than that, you can see how I've changed the different holdings. If you guys wanna be able to look at this same thing and click around and see the individual yield of every different pie, there's a link in the description to the updated pie that I'm showing in this video with all the new changes. You guys can click on that link. It'll open it in your desktop, and then you can click around and see exactly what I changed in the target percentages. And I'll let you know as I make different changes to this. So this is an ongoing thing. I'm trying to consolidate and refine this portfolio to be a very versatile, very strong one that can go through different economic environments. So that's the overriding goal of it. But these are the changes I've made so far. Now, one other thing I want to look at before I move on to the news. September has come and gone, and as such, we can look at how much I made in the month of September. Here is the actual monthly graph. This is where, since the beginning of my portfolio, since January of 2018, I have charted out every single month over month how much money I've earned in dividends. You can see the timeline as I've deposited, reinvested, built up my portfolio. You can see each month how much money I made. And then in September, I earned $161.85. So the high is still in July, $166, but I almost passed that in September. Who knows if I'll pass it next month. But as you can see, the current trend, the trajectory is going up drastically. This is how it works. All my companies pay at different times. Like I said, you can't really control the, the time that you pay. And I don't think it's good to base your portfolio off of how frequent or when companies pay dividends. Um, some of them pay monthly, but I wouldn't try to really target companies that pay monthly or ones that pay on certain dates. I think it's better to just own a handful of really good ones. Most of the time, it's pretty spread out anyways. You can see that month to month, I'm earning a good amount of money. That amount of money is going up over time. I want this to continue. I want it to where 
$160 is like nothing. I'm earning over $200 every single month. So with these new positions and trading around the $6,000, putting it into other companies, it'll take some time for that to take effect because I'll have to go into those new ex-dividend dates, those new payout dates and have that be reflected here. So I'm confident that this will continue to trend up over time as my portfolio grows. This type of stuff is better to track than looking day by day and seeing what this number is here. This number can be really scary. You can see right here, it's $654. Yay, I was up a lot of money on Friday when the market recovered, but then I can easily go back to here and look at negative $728, this bright red number and percentages aiming downwards and you think that you're gonna lose everything, right? If you focus too much on these day-to-day -day swings, it'll just cause some anxiety, some fear, make you do dumb decisions. If you look at the eagle eye view, if you look at the projections over time, what you've actually built up since starting your portfolio, it paints a different picture. I think this is a lot better to look at than the day to day. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on to some news. This is two hours of audio released from somebody that works at Facebook that secretly recorded this audio and then they sold it to The Verge, a different website. And the reason that this is pretty interesting is because usually Zuckerberg is a very guarded individual. He's very cautious in what he says, very controlled. Uh, but in this, he's speaking real candidly because he doesn't know that he's being recorded. And so you see him out of his robot form. You see him a little bit more humanized here. And funny enough, they're, they're going to fire whoever leaked this audio. They'll be searching for that individual and they'll fire him because he broke confidentiality agreements with the company. But I actually think that this audio that was leaked, at least in my view, it improved my outlook on Zuckerberg. It doesn't make me hold a more negative view of them. I thought that what he was saying was very reasonable. I thought it was a, I just thought everything that he said was really good. He talks about a lot of different subjects. He talks about Elizabeth Warren wanting to break up big tech companies. This is something that we've talked about a lot on the show. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, in this instance, I agree with Mark Zuckerberg. I don't agree with Elizabeth Warren on this. So these are two Democrats, two liberals, Mark Zuckerberg and Elizabeth Warren, that both have different opinions on this. Let's go ahead and play the first clip here. This is the one where he actually calls out Elizabeth Warren by name. Elizabeth Warren did respond to this through Twitter in a really aggressive response. So I'll go ahead and play this clip first. Like Elizabeth Warren, who thinks that the right answer is to break up the companies, um, you know, I mean, if she gets elected president, then I would, I would bet that we will have a legal challenge, and I would bet that we will win the legal challenge. Does that still suck for us? Yeah. I mean, I don't have to, you know, have a major lawsuit against our own government. I mean, that's not like the position that you want to be in when you're, you know, I mean, it's like we, we care about our country and like want to work with our government to do good things. And, um, but, but look, at the end of the day, if someone's going to try to threaten something that existential, you go to the map and you fight. This I thought was a great answer from Zuckerberg. He was asked about the potential of a breakup of Facebook. And he says, yeah, you have someone that's like Elizabeth Warren that has expressed interest in coming in. If she becomes president, she'll come in and she'll want to break up Facebook like Standard Oil, break it into a bunch of different companies. You'll have Facebook.com is probably one company, Instagram is another, WhatsApp is another, and those will be three individual companies. He's saying that he doesn't think that that's a good idea. In a different clip, he'll list off his reasons why. But in this, he says, I don't want to have to fight our government. I don't want to bring up lawsuits against them or have a legal challenge. He goes, but at the end of the day, this is the company that I created. I'm going to go to the mat and fight for it if that challenge comes. So he says that that would suck to do. I don't want to have to do that. I want to work with our government. I want to do good things for our country. He probably politically, I think it's fair to say that Mark Zuckerberg, I think is on the more Democrat liberal side. So this isn't like political ideology. This is a disagreement over the role of companies, over the role of governments and how they play into our system. Mark Zuckerberg has said repeatedly that Facebook is not a monopoly. He does not believe that his company owns a monopoly. I don't either. I think a monopoly is when you don't have any other choice. Like if I have a utility company that comes to my home and they plug in utilities and they're the only one in 100 miles. That's a monopoly. I have no other choice of any other utility company to go with. Some people, they have the same thing with internet. They only have one option for internet. Facebook is just an online social media website. I don't use it all that often. We have lots of choices of different ways to share our information socially, and that's just a choice. People could move away from Facebook anytime they want. So I agree with more of what Mark Zuckerberg is, the side that he's on with this, but we can look and see how Elizabeth Warren responded to this after this audio was leaked. She said in a tweet, 
What would really suck, and scare quotes, quoting Mark Zuckerberg there, what would really suck is if we don't fix a corrupt system that lets giant companies like Facebook engage in illegal anti-competitive practices, stomp on our consumer privacy rights, and repeatedly fumble their responsibility to protect our democracy. So she's saying, you know, they, they're anti-competitive. These companies are preventing other companies from competition. They haven't protected us from election meddling, I think is what she's referencing there with protect our democracy. So she has some valid claims. I think that there's some valid points with what Elizabeth Warren is saying that when platforms become big enough, they can use that scale and leverage to have a competitive advantage. Now, Mark Zuckerberg in another clip gives more reasons of why he thinks it's a bad idea for his companies to be broken up and how it actually does the opposite of fix these problems. It's just that breaking up these companies, whether it's Facebook or Google or Amazon, um, is not actually going to solve the issues. And, you know, it doesn't make election interference uh, less likely. It makes it more likely because now the companies can't coordinate and work together. He just says breaking up these companies is not going to fix this meddling. It's not going to fix these issues. It'll make it so that the companies are more scattered about. They can't coordinate together. They can't solve these issues as well. In another clip, he takes a jab at Twitter and says why they're not able to solve these problems. That's why Twitter can't do as good of a job as we can. I mean, they face qualitatively the same types of issues, but they're, you know, I mean, they, they, they can't put in the investment. Our, our investment on safety is bigger than the whole revenue of their company. They literally <laughs> cannot do it. You hear that? Everybody's laughing in that meeting. He just said that Twitter faces qualitatively the same issues that Facebook does with fake accounts, election meddling, uh, privacy issues, people that are predators on, on their website, all the same issues that Facebook faces. But Twitter, since it's not as big and profitable as Facebook, cannot invest the money. They don't have the capital to be able to put into their company to hire the right people and to put in the effort and tools that would solve that issue. He said that Facebook invests more into its safety than the entire revenue of Twitter. I believe him. Facebook is massively bigger than Twitter. It's a far more profitable company. And as such, it has more capital available to be able to solve those issues. So I think that these are really good arguments that Zuckerberg is making. He's saying that if you hamper these companies by breaking them up into Twitter sized companies, that's not going to solve these issues. It'll just make it worse. In another section, he talks about TikTok. I don't know how many of you heard about TikTok, but probably a lot of you because this app is growing rapidly. I read a Wall Street Journal write-up on it that says TikTok videos are goofy, its strategy to dominate social media is serious. To give you an idea of the type of videos that TikTok has, I'll go ahead and play just a couple here. They're really dumb, short video clips that is what is termed like popcorn content. Has really no significance, you're not going to learn anything from it, it's just really easy to feed on content that's kind of entertaining for a few seconds. Here's an example of a TikTok video. But that's all right. It's lots of fun, kind of mindless, goofy dances like that. Lots of choreographed dances, lots of lip syncing. And then people will start trends, like different dances, and other people try to match or do the same dance, like in this video. It's hard to breathe, but that's all right. Hush. Usually the videos are less than 15 seconds long. And this has garnered a social media platform from a company that's worth about $75 billion. Just in the US, TikTok has been downloaded over 104 million times and nearly 1.2 billion times worldwide. 1.2 billion worldwide, 104 million in the US. This is an extremely popular platform. There's actual content creators that you can follow on it if you like the type of videos that they make. They try to avoid anything that is too deep, anything that's political, anything that's too thought provoking. That's not what this platform's about. It's about really easy to digest content that you can go in and just have a laugh in 15 seconds. But Mark Zuckerberg, of course, has taken note of the growth of this company. It reads, elsewhere in the conversation, Zuckerberg presented a plan for halting the global advance of its latest competitor, ByteDance's video app, TikTok. The company introduced a clone named Lasso and released it in Mexico, where TikTok has yet to make inroads in an attempt to perfect the product before rolling it out elsewhere. We have uh, a product uh, called Lasso that's a, a standalone app that we're, um, that we're working on trying to get product market fit in countries like Mexico is, is I think, one of the first initial ones. Um, so we're trying to first see if we can, we can get it to work in countries where TikTok is not already big, or we go and compete in country, with TikTok in countries where they are big. 
He doesn't say it in this clip, but Mark Zuckerberg also notices that this is one of the first companies that has came out from China that's a massive social media company. If you try to think of other massive Chinese social media companies, all of them are clones of American companies, but in China. What they do is they usually just look at Facebook, they look at Google, they look at different American companies, they make it difficult to have a market in their country, and instead they just replicate the same product in their country. This is the first time that a Chinese company has been able to release a social media platform in America and have that platform grow to hundreds of millions of users. So Mark Zuckerberg has taken notice of this. He says that it's interesting, but he is not afraid of the competition. I read through a lot of the transcript and he says that uh, a lot of it is based off of their rapid marketing. He thinks that they can come out with a better product, that Lasso will be a better product. And he thinks that he has the power to drive this product to be extremely popular and pass up TikTok. This also highlights another point that I think is often underlooked by people wanting to break up these companies. If Facebook is not big enough, if it doesn't have the capital to be able to reinvest back into other competing products, it gives the US a disadvantage in competing with China. China is not going to break up its companies. The government is not hostile to its big companies. If China comes and it has these large social media companies in the US, the US needs to be able to compete with that. Having large companies like Facebook be able to invest the capital to come up with new apps to compete with these companies is a pretty important thing for, I think, our longstanding competitive advantage. So something else to consider there when you're looking at breaking up these different companies. Now, the other news I wanted to mention, I got a few questions about this. Schwab, a huge online brokerage, cut its trading fees. So it doesn't cost any money to buy and sell stock on it. And then immediately, a lot of other brokerages also cut their trading fees because it all of a sudden made them not competitive. So this has been something that has been predicted for a long time. In fact, M1 Finance, the CEO, wrote a blog post about this August 30th of 2018. And he said about eight months ago, so eight months before August 30th, 2018, he said, M1 announced we removed all fees to offer free investing experience to the users. And so he talked about how he thinks that that's the direction that these investment brokerages are going to move because him as the owner of the company, as the CEO, the one running M1 Finance, he knows that you do not need a charge for trades to run a profitable brokerage. And the idea that people have to pay for every single trade, which technology wise, that's about the same as paying $5 to send an email. That's about the same as what you're paying for when you're paying for a trade. So technology wise, it costs nothing. We've automated the process of doing that. And these older brokerages have charged because they have no reason otherwise, right? Nobody else was doing it for free. It's the type of thing where if all of them just kind of keep charging, well, there's no reason to lower that fees. It's a huge income for them that has no overhead. So these brokerages like Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, they've taken advantage of the fact that there's been no brokerages like M1 Finance or Robinhood for a very long time. They've charged you fees for trading if you invested before then simply because they could. But since there was a disruption in the industry, since brokerages like Robinhood, M1 Finance, you know, these other robo-advisors like Acorns, since they came along, they exploited that imbalance in cost and value. They said that, you know, we don't need a charge for these fees, so we can offer them for free and we can start scooping up customers because these older brokerages, they're wanting to continue that cash flow. They want to keep having that money. And as the CEO of M1 Finance notes in this blog post, he knew that was going to eventually come to an end. That eventually the other brokerages, they would see that they're losing a lot of potential customers and as a result, they would drop their fees. So the question that's been asked me a lot is, what do I plan on doing? Does this change my thoughts about M1 Finance or am I going to switch to another brokerage? As well as what will it do with the industry? So I think between M1 Finance and Robinhood, that this hurts Robinhood a lot more because Schwab kind of functions the same way that Robinhood does. It doesn't have fractional shares. Uh, it doesn't have the same type of system where you can put things into percentages, into the pies and organize your portfolio this way. Robinhood is the same type of thing where you can buy whole shares, you can buy and sell anytime. You know, it's not confined to a trading window and there's no automated investing, automatically putting that money into underweight holdings. None of that exists with Robinhood. So Robinhood, I think, will be hurt by Schwab going free. 
I don't think it will kill Robin Hood. I think that a lot of people will stick to it because they like the interface and the simplicity of it more. But I think that they're actually competitors with each other. M1 Finance, I think, has differentiated itself from the competition enough. I don't think it's a direct competitor to Schwab. I don't plan on moving from M1 Finance to Schwab because they made their trades free. I've had Robinhood as a free option to go to a brokerage like that where it runs the same way, where it has a list of companies. I've had that available to me for years now and I've stuck with M1 Finance because of a lot of different reasons. If you go to most brokerages and you actually look at your portfolio, it looks similar to the holdings tab on M1 Finance. Usually they don't have the icons of the companies, so it'd be more just the names of the companies, the ticker symbol, your price point on them, and, and this type of information. And so a lot of times what you're looking at when you're looking at your portfolio on a standard brokerage is a linear list of companies running down where you see the shares of it. They have a lot more in-depth information about the companies. But the thing that I like about M1 Finance is it takes it off of this Excel style list and it puts it into something I think is a lot easier to visualize and to keep track of. So I can go and I can say, I want 20% of my portfolio to be in bonds. And then within that 20%, I wanna break it up between these. And then every time I put in money, it gets automatically dispersed into those weightings. I don't have to go to a list of companies and try to calculate that, what the percentages are of each and make it so that I have 20% bonds. And within those 20%, I have these different types of bonds in each. That's a much more difficult thing to do if you're looking at a flat list of companies and you're trying to manage your portfolio that way. So to me, the original reason that I went to M1 Finance wasn't because it was free. Like I said, there is Robinhood that was another free option. There's Acorns that was another free option. The reason that I liked M1 Finance to begin with is because I think it lays out portfolios in a much more easy to understand way and a little bit easier to control. So I will say, I think it's awesome that these companies like Robinhood and M1 Finance and you know Acorns, the, all the different robo-advisors came in and they really forced the industry to change. The industry had an outdated model. They were charging people for things that they didn't need to charge them for. And these brokerages forced them to adapt, forced them to create a better product that offers more value to the end consumer. So I really like that fact about it. I like that these brokerages are free now. Being able to come in and buy any shares of company, having everyday people be able to come in and buy shares of different companies, become owners of these different great companies and participate in the rewards when they do really well, I think is a great thing. So overall, I really like the move. I think it's awesome having more selection. I've said this before, I think in the US we're particularly spoiled. If you're in Europe or something, like you're likely gonna still have to pay for trades for a while. I think this type of competition will make it so that there's more free brokerages in Europe uh, relatively soon. So I think it will be expanding overseas into other areas, Europe and Canada pretty soon. But cool stuff to see here. Schwab cutting its fees, all these other brokerages cutting its fees, um, I think is an awesome thing to see. All right, now the fun part. Let's get to some questions, some emails. You can email me anytime, josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. That's josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. You can also write in on Twitter or Instagram. I also respond to those as well. The first one is MT Theory. He says, I was going to subscribe to your channel. Then I realized you own Wells Fargo, a company that literally stole money from account holders and opened new accounts without their permission. Textbook fraud. These kind of comments are my favorite. I don't know what motivates people to leave comments like this. I was going to subscribe to your channel, but then I realized you own Wells Fargo. I don't know, you know, I really don't know how I'm gonna survive without M Theory's, uh, without M Theory here being a subscriber. I don't know how the channel's gonna continue to go on. I don't even know what I'm gonna do with my life. After him not subscribing, but almost subscribing, but he's probably gonna continue watching the videos even if he's not a subscriber. I really don't know how I'm gonna handle this, you know? Uh, this is a pretty tragic event to have happen, but really, Wells Fargo, of course it's had fraud. I know that it's had fraud, I've talked about it. We had Elizabeth Warren breathe fire into last CEO until he quit, right? So this has been pointed out before. A company is formed by policies, by its employees, and by its leadership. The leadership has changed with Wells Fargo. We have Charlie Scharf as a new appointed CEO. He doesn't have a history of fraud. He's a pretty straight shooter. He's worked at lots of great companies and he's actively going to work to get rid of incentives that would promote any kind of fraud within the company. He's going to work to change the branding of Wells Fargo so that it doesn't have all this negative branding associated with it. He's going to take the company in a new direction. So M Theory, in all seriousness, 
I bet a lot of the products that you use, a lot of the services that you use are from companies that have committed enormous frauds in the past. If you have a garbage can or recycling bin from waste management, then you are paying monthly to a company that committed enormous fraud. Around the year 2000, waste management committed massive accounting fraud. It was the biggest accounting fraud prior to like Enron that waste management committed. They did all these accounting tricks to totally misrepresent the company. It lost people massive amounts of money. That was much bigger fraud than what Wells Fargo has committed. We have instances like Boeing that had two planes crash because of a massive breakdown in its policies and, and the way that evaluated these risks. We have companies like J&J, a family company, right? That says that it puts the consumer over the investor. And they have reports that they knew that their powder, their baby powder had asbestos in it, right? And they still continue to sell it. So you have all these different companies committing fraud. If you never invest in a company that has ever committed fraud in the past, you're going to rule out a lot of companies that have changed their leadership, changed their incentives, changed the way that they're structured and the way that they run, and they're no longer really the same company they were before. So the best thing to do is look at a company and if it has committed fraud, see if it's going in a different direction. With Wells Fargo, Charlie Scharf has not committed fraud. I think he's gonna take the company in a different direction. I think that one of his primary goals will probably be getting away of anything that could brand the company as one that messes with accounts or commits this type of fraud. Next question. Hi, I'm a 19 year old Canadian student starting my college education the next three months and I have a question. I'm very passionate about finance and the investing world. I started reading books and learning about the subject about two years ago. This week I've read on The Economist that the majority of jobs in finance will be replaced by artificial intelligence by the time I'm 30. What do you make of this? And it's finance college degree still a good option. Thanks. I love the videos, by the way. All right. So you're going to college. You have an interest in finance and investing. And you read an article that most of the jobs in that field will be automated away. So you're wondering whether it's going to be worth your money. Now, there's two different parts to this answer. I actually... With automation, I have a lot of opinions about this subject, and mostly they're not the popular opinions on it, right? There's a the really popular opinions on automation. It's a big thing right now. And mine are uh, pretty contrary to what most people hold as their opinion on automation. I do not think that automation will remove as many jobs as people are saying that it's going to. So that's a summary of it, but there's a lot more that I think uh, gives validity to my side of this argument. Now, you say that, uh, you know, they say that most jobs in finance will be replaced by AI. So I do think that there's degrees that are more valuable than other degrees. There's degrees that put you in positions where you're going to learn, earn a lot of money, where you have a really competitive advantage in the marketplace. And then there's degrees where you spend a lot of money, you get in debt, and you don't really get the bang for your buck. So I do think it's important to realize what degree you're going into. But finance, I think, is a pretty dang good degree to go into. Learning about finance, I think you can offer a lot of value there. The issue is, is that there's different types of jobs in every single field. And automation is only going to remove a certain subset of jobs in each field. For instance, I've heard about automation and how it's going to take over all the jobs and everything for the last 10 years. For as long as I can remember, I've heard about this boogeyman automation that's going to steal everybody's jobs, right? The robots are going to steal everybody's jobs. I've only seen certain types of jobs get removed. And those are ones where you do redundant tasks that are completely repetitive, that require no discernment, no judgment, no human input. For instance, a good example of that is taking orders. If you take orders at a fast food place, what type of judgment or decision making are you using when you take orders from somebody? Nothing really. And so what they did is they replaced a lot of those jobs with just screens that people can punch in their order. So there's a human touch of talking to somebody. Maybe that's a benefit, but a lot of people look at that as actually a, a disadvantage. They rather just order off of a screen. The point is, though, that that type of job, no offense to anybody that's working fast food, right? Everybody has to do something to make money. But that type of job, you are not making any decisions. You're not you're not using your judgment. You're not using your your brain and the thinking capacity and the intelligence that you have when taking an order from somebody. And that's why those jobs are typically considered miserable because people aren't being challenged. You're not thinking of anything when you're just listening to somebody punching in some buttons exactly what they say. So those type of jobs are going to be automated. Anything that is entirely repetitive, 
that requires no judgment, no discernment. Those are the type of things that robots can do really well. When it comes to things where there's actually human judgment, there's decision making, you have to use your brain. Those are the type of jobs that are going to be around. So if you look at finance, what you want to do is study the type of positions that robots can't do. They can't look at new problems and decide how to solve them. And this has been proven over and over again. We're not even close to the phase where robots can be introduced to a new problem and without any interjection from humans, they can go and just figure out how to solve new problems. I've worked in programming for a long time. I've looked at lots of examples of this. They can't figure it out. I'll give you an example of this. Um, we have certain political candidates, and I know that this might make me really unpopular because they're telling a story about how automation is going to wipe out a lot of people's jobs. They paint a pretty grim future of what's going to happen. I don't agree with that. I think the future is much brighter. I don't think that a lot of jobs that people want are going to be wiped out. And I think the capital freed up from those jobs being wiped out is going to create a lot of better jobs that people will be able to do that are higher paying that require a little bit more thought. So I don't follow these type of grim futures where the, the robots are going to take over everybody's job. Some of them, even supporting different candidates and, and kind of going along with this theme, are like Elon Musk, who's the big futurist guy, right? He thinks that robots will eventually do everything better than humans. He said that, that robots are going to do everything better than humans. But Elon Musk invested hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, into his factories, making them entirely ran by robots and he had so many problems that he ended up investing billions of dollars into retooling them back to where they ran a lot by humans mostly by humans and that's when he made that famous tweet that humans are underrated he learned that his own hypothesis that robots can just do factory assembly cheaper and easier than humans was wrong he found out that the robots, they would have certain issues. If one thing was off, they would start compounding the issue and keep working on it without, without a human recognizing it. And then it would turn into a disastrously expensive issue because a robot wouldn't catch it when a human would. When things don't go as planned, humans are better at figuring out and fixing that type of thing. And the robots were costly. A lot of times they would malfunction. There's all these issues. And this is on an assembly line. This is the type of thing that robots should be fantastic at. Redundant tasks that are just repetitive and go over and over again, they weren't really able to work even in a factory like Tesla. Even in the type of person that invested a lot of money and tried to make it mostly ran by robots, found out the shortcomings of it. So like I said, I could go on, I could do a whole hour on this, but uh, I'll talk a little bit longer about it. So the part of the picture, like I said, that's being painted is really grim that these robots are going to take over everybody's jobs that anybody what you're doing right now what you're learning right now isn't going to be worth much because there's just going to be a robot to do it i don't agree with this at all it's something that i've heard for the past decade and i've seen implemented very little like i said mostly with uh, grocery stores and automated checkout things that require no decision making things that require no judgment those are the only type of things i've seen this implemented with and to even further this point we can look here the last jobs released just this week that we gained another 136,000 jobs, the unemployment hit a 50 year low. Even the lowest educated rung of Americans are employed. And so if automation is increasing over the past 10 years, taking over everybody's jobs, and those people aren't able to find better jobs that are, are more involved and that pay better and are able to, you know, satisfy the human desire to think and use your brain, right? Not just be somebody that screws in an, an, a bolt after bolt on an assembly line. If that's happening, if robots are taking over all these, all these jobs, why did unemployment hit a 50 year low? That doesn't make sense. 50 years ago, we had far less automation, less technology, less machine learning than we have today. So why is the unemployment rate so low right now? You might argue that these people are just taking on really low paying jobs, they're still struggling to find that, but that wouldn't even hold true. We look at the unemployment rate and out of all those people that have jobs right now, just a tiny fraction of Americans, just 0.28% of the 156 million workers earn the federal minimum wage. Meaning out of the jobs that even exist, most of them are paying above the federal minimum wage. So these type of data points contradict the message that every job is going to be automated, that people aren't going to be able to find work. Most Americans are employed. The unemployment rate is at a 50 year low. And of those Americans that are employed, a tiny percentage 
a quarter of a percentage earn the minimum wage. The rest are earning above minimum wage because the value that they're providing is more than what the federal government is requiring them to be paid. So I could go on about this, but my main point is, is that in every industry, there's going to be groups of people that have their job automated away, groups of people that do not. What you need to do is look at finance and look at the type of jobs in finance, in business that robots are able to do, that you know uh, other factors are able to easily be implemented and do what they're doing and go to the other side. Go to the type of jobs that aren't easy for robots to automate. When I, you know, I, like I said, I, I do programming. I've written lots of code and lots of different applications that make it so that we don't need to hire as many people, that we don't need as much human labor because now we have applications that, that streamline different processes. But the type of thing that I'm automating, the type of jobs that I'm automating away are the type of jobs where they're very linear. It's mostly like a computer assembly line where somebody sits there, they copy information from one place to another. They do really simple calculated tasks that, that are just done repeatedly over and over again. You know, there's different things that applications can streamline and make it so that you need less jobs there. But even on a, a bigger scale, if you look at what happens, all that does is free up capital for the company to open up new positions in other areas in the same company that will make it so that those same people that would be automated away, now they can take on more interesting roles in different parts of the company. So the idea that those jobs just no longer exist, that that capital won't be used for anything, I think is complete nonsense. The money that is saved from jobs being automated is always reinvested. You can look at any scenario, that money will be reinvested to create new jobs. Let's look at one scenario. You free up a lot of uh, money through automating a handful of people out of their job at a company. Well, you have more money now. You have more profits. That's capitalism. You created a more efficient way to accomplish the same thing. That is exactly how capitalism works. Now with that capital, that extra capital, there's a couple things you could do with it. You can hire different people in different roles. You can pay them more because now you have more money to work with. and what that does is that just creates more jobs that are more interesting than the ones that were routine jobs that were automated away. The other option, let's say that the owner of the company is really greedy. Let's say that he doesn't wanna create new jobs. He just wants to pocket that money. What do greedy owners of different companies do with their money? Do they sit in a bank account and let it devalue at 2% a year? No, they, they invest it. That's what wealthy people do with their excess money. What does that invested money in the stock market do? It helps provide capital to other companies to be able to hire more workers, to be able to open up more positions. So either way, the money will be put to work that's freed up. I haven't seen it played out with this doom and gloom of nobody being able to find jobs. I think that, like I said, in, in every industry, there's going to be a portion of jobs that are automated. Those are typically not the ones you want to be doing anyways. They don't exercise your brain. They don't require a lot of judgment. Uh, you want to get into that portion that can't be automated. So that's my advice with it. It's pretty general there. I know that, that you know, this is a really, I think, an unpopular opinion. There's a lot of people on the other side that are really fearful of the future. They're fearful that there's not going to be enough work for people. But like I said, with this jobs report, with the statistics that we're looking at, and just the trends I've seen over the past 10 years with these same predictions, I have not seen it played out. Okay, moving on. Green Moxie says, I'm starting to think this passive growth video is BS. Does anyone here mirror this portfolio? I tried it for a week and received consistent loss. All right, Green Moxie. And to anybody else that's tried this passive income strategy for a whole week and hasn't received money hand over fist, I just wanna let you know that this takes longer than a week. Your timeline for investing in this type of portfolio that I have it should be years, should be at a minimum three years. If your timeline is less than three years, you shouldn't even open up an account. You probably shouldn't even invest in this type of portfolio. There's no way to tell which way the market's gonna go in a week, let alone a year. It's actually difficult to tell which way it's gonna go in three years. So judging it by a week is definitely not gonna work. In fact, even in a week, that's not enough time to actually be paid a dividend. You could cross through maybe the ex-dividend date of a couple companies, but that's not even a time to get paid. So you need to invest at least three months until you actually start seeing dividends rolling with this strategy, which is a huge portion of the gains that you're going to be getting from this type of portfolio. So Green Moxie, hang in there for more than a week. Change your thought process a little bit here. Think instead of a week, think three years. I've been doing it for almost two years now, and you can see the consistent income growth that I've had with it. So hang in there for more than a week. You got to change your mind frame. This is a long-term game we're playing here. These aren't, this isn't a quick way to make money. 
All right, guys. Well, I think I'm going to end it there. Go ahead and give this video a like if you like it. Apparently, that helps with the YouTube algorithm. So um, make sure you like it. If you're not a subscriber, hit the subscribe button. And I do have the show on audio and other different formats as well. But feel free to email in anytime, josephcarlsonshow at gmail.com. Let me know your thoughts on everything that's going on. We'll see you guys next time. Hush.